Good morning, Maureen. How are you today? I am great. How about you, Heather? I am so good. Thank you so much for being here and part of the podcast. I am so excited to chat with you. So much of our vision and mission aligns really well with what you do and with what we do here at She Leads Me. Why don't you go ahead and kick it off and share with our audience who don't know you, who you are and what it is that you do? What's your mission in this world? Yeah. So obviously my name is Maureen Divine All, um, and it's so funny you asked me what's my mission. I mean, my mission is to empower leaders to lead better, to lead differently, to, I've been saying a lot recently, build back better within our homes and our organizations, Um, but really lifting leaders up to feel empowered, to have the courage and the skills um, to lead differently moving forward. So um, I say all leaders, but I have a particular affection for for women leaders. And as I hope we'll get a chance to talk about, um, yeah. I just I just published a book. It's called How to Make the Matriarchy: The Power and Promise of Prioritizing Women. And my big takeaway from that project is that when there are more women in rooms where decisions are being made, everything improves for all of humanity. Yeah, um, and so it's it's to our benefit to empower all leaders who are willing to lead in to building more equitable and inclusive spaces. Mm, yeah, I love that. When did you feel that was true? When did you really notice that that statement, that uh, understanding, that that needed to be? When was that moment or moments for you? Yeah. Um, I think I always felt it in my gut, but I wasn't sure I had the like evidence or the the like hard facts that I felt like to back it up. Like it was always a feeling when you're in the room or I've worked a lot predominantly in nonprofit spaces, which are usually filled with amazing women, you know, changing communities and keeping our communities going. So I saw it, but I was like, you know, where's the evidence? And that was really part of what set me out on this book writing journey was to take what I felt and what I felt like I was observing and understand like what, what are the facts and the evidence and the data behind it that's out there that I should know. And so, yeah, through the process of writing that feeling definitely morphed into a certainty. Um, And it came through stories from around the world where, you know, change advanced quickly and, and for the better. Um, You know, one story I love that I think is so transformational for me is when I found out that Rwanda is number one in the world for parliamentary representation by women. Like Rwanda, Mm. I never would Mm. have guessed that. And a lot of times I'll I'll challenge my friends and say, take a guess. And they'll say New Zealand or Norway or something like that. And no, it's Rwanda. And and the story there is that after, um, you know, genocide in 1994, um, most of who was left predominantly living in that country was women. And so what had one time been a really oppressive country for women, they couldn't own land, you know, they weren't often getting educated, they weren't, they didn't have economic independence. You know, suddenly these were the women who had to rebuild their country and were rebuilding their communities. And today their parliament is made up 64% women. And you see the rapid progress that this country has had with 64% of women um, now women are economically empowered. They own land. Um, they are, are getting more educated. Um, so it's stories like those that made me go, yes, this is true. You put women in the rooms where things are happening and progress can accelerate quite quickly. Yeah, that's such yeah, a fascinating. I had no idea that's, that that was the case for them. That's really incredible. Mm -hmm. really awesome to see women come together to lift each other up and help build and grow something together. It's too often that we see the opposite happening Mm -hmm. and it's really empowering to hear that story and hear about women that are doing that for a country and how the benefits and, you know, relatively a short period of time, like since the nineties can make such a turnaround. So that's amazing. Yeah. Tell me what a day-to-day looks like for you on this mission you've written this book how do you how are then you also propelling that mission forward um, in your day-to-day work yeah well I'm spending lots more time talking about it I think through that journey of of becoming centered in knowing 
not only were my feelings and, and observations spot on, but now I've got this data and this storytelling. I mean, Rwanda is just one of the stories I tell in the book of solid evidence. And so my day to day now is, you know, spending time with folks like you talking with different audiences, because I think so much of this too, um, I, I want other women and leaders to feel empowered to go, okay, to have that same transformation I did, like it's there. I no longer have to wonder if it's true or guess if it's true or hypothesize if we try it, will be true, will it be true? Um, mm -hmm. I can just go, I, I know this to be true. I know this to be true because it's been demonstrated around the world and it's time for us to lean in, accept it as true, and then change our lenses on how we do things, on how we lead, on how we build those rooms where decisions are happening. So I love talking with you. I love talking with audiences. I love talking about the book um, and just expanding people's knowledge. But then um, I also work as a leadership coach. Um, and so working one on one or with groups of leaders um, to kind of knock down bias, build new lenses, reframe the way that we think. and. What I love is that I do this really from a spirit of inclusion. So that's a big part of where the title of the book came from. It's, you know, the cover of the book actually says how to smash the patriarchy and that's crossed out and then make the matriarchy. And that's really that, because, <laughs> yeah, it's really because a girlfriend and I, you know, we were having lunch one day and griping about work and she like slammed her fist on the table and went like, I know, smash the patriarchy, right? And I was like, you know, I just, I don't know how we get anywhere when it feels like war, when it feels sure. like, you know, women are trying to take power away, you know, that like scarcity mindset. And what I found is that's not it at all. And where I really solidified, you know, sticking with the word matriarchy was I found a scholar who essentially said, who has studied matriarchies, who said, it's about power. It's not about gender. It's about power structures. And patriarchy is a power over others structure. So you can be a woman in a patriarchal structure. You can be an all female organization. And still, if you're running things from a power over others perspective, it's still patriarchal. Whereas matriarchies are about the power of inclusion, about like, what is our collective power when we all come together? Um, and that's really where I work from. And that's really where I teach from. And gotten a lot of great feedback from guys, actually, which I didn't expect in this book writing process, who have said, you really opened my mind. This wasn't preachy. This wasn't judgy. I didn't know half this stuff. And now that I do, I recognize ways in which I can change. Um, and, and well, that's an encouraging. Ally. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it, it really is encouraging. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. It's been nice. It's been a really great experience. Yeah. So then as there are certain women that feel very comfortable kind of like leading that charge within certain organizations where we really are addressing gender equality, right? And positions mm -hmm. of leadership that have maybe typically been male dominated, or we're still seeing gender bias in some of those roles for the brave female leader that is trying to kind of tackle that and take that on and help see what's not being seen in maybe their company or wherever it is that they're involved in. Maybe it's a club or an, a volunteer organization. How then do, do they make effective change? Like if there's somebody listening to this right now that is in a position like that, where their messaging is falling on deaf ears maybe a little bit, and they're still there every single day in it, trying to hopefully make that change. And it's one versus however many. Um, how would you encourage a woman to bring people along in that journey to help educate others in a way that maybe doesn't feel, um, I, I guess there's kind of a balance. You kind of have to dance around breaking down old beliefs and helping people rebuild the new, where does somebody start? <laughs> yeah. So I always say, or where I got to in the book, both for myself and, and everybody who was reading was really like, look at your sphere of influence. Hmm. What is within your sphere of influence? And, you know, the workplace you described just sounded like pretty horrible. <laughs> Nobody's <laughs> listening and you can't move any mountains 
you know, maybe I that's was in that work situation. So maybe I'm yeah. speaking too much from experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, if it was really that bad and nobody's even willing to listen, I would say, okay, your sphere of influence is like, let's find a new place to work. But I know that's not an option for everybody, but I would start by saying like, truly look at your sphere of influence. Is that at home? Is that with your partner? Is that with other family relationships? And maybe you can move some of those markers there. So by example, something I discovered in writing the book, there's, you know, one of my chapters is on gender-based violence and how we can't have equality until gender-based violence um, is eliminated. And I had this moment of realization that um, I need to talk to my daughter differently. Like when she comes home Mm -hmm. and complains about like boys chasing her on the playground and how annoying they are. And I used to answer, well, you know, sweetie, sometimes boys do that just because they like you. Mm -hmm. I went like, oh my gosh, I am teaching her that like love can be equals annoying somebody or chasing them or harassing them. Um, And that's not okay. So that's like my sphere of influence, home, kitchen table. I can do it right now and make that change. And I think when I start doing those things and what I would, you know, say to readers is when you start doing those things, I think your courage builds. Like your courage builds to know, like, this is right. This is right. So what I would say for that workplace situation is to look at, like, is there anybody that has power in the existing power structure that could become an ally for you that you could take out to lunch, take out to coffee, just have a a sidebar conversation and say, look, like I've noticed this and, and here's what I know to be true, you know? arm yourself Mm -hmm. with some knowledge and with some facts and say, I'd really love your partnership on this. Mm -hmm. Um, And I was actually advising a friend to do this. And she was very honest. She said, you know, my organization is is not a place I could do that. There's not enough psychological safety for me to do that with any of the rest of my leadership team, which is all men. And so we've had honest conversations about her finding her way out of that organization because she realizes Mm -hmm. it's, not going to change no matter how hard she tries, but sure. The cost is too high of her in that situation. Yeah. Yeah. But I've talked with plenty of women who go, Oh, well, you know, I do have a good relationship with so-and-so. I wonder if he even notices this. And a lot of times they don't, and it's just helping them shift a perspective in a very, um, you know, collaborative way that, Mm -hmm. and maybe that person can start to be an ally for you in meetings. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's how it starts. Yeah. In the situations where, you know, we're talking about a pretty broad topic that goes into so many different arenas when we're talking about not only just gender equality, but when we look at the pay equality within Mm -hmm. that as well. So the layers within building this community, this more um, equality overall, I oftentimes will see in my place of work, and I'd love to hear your feedback, where people can get a certain, they can get to a certain place and they hit a sticky point for certain people within the organization, potentially like pay gap. And then it feels like you're kind of stuck again. And how do we move forward on that? I'd love to hear... um, if that's true for you and the audiences that you you speak to and are in as well and how somebody can kind of help overcome that as like a next step. We're making some progress and now there's another tricky topic that comes up. How do we navigate? Such a great and juicy subject. And so um, I'm actually, so the print edition of my book is out, but I'm working on recording my audio book right now. And just this morning, I recorded part of a chapter on economic empowerment for women so it's fresh in my brain that I say, like, the struggle is real. Like, <laughs> this is not just happening to you. Like, there are systemic things in place in workplaces that have been for a really long time that perpetuate these gaps. Um, and so a couple of things to, like, get straight to your question. What I talk about in the book, which I think is interesting, is that a lot of us know about the pay gap. And I think that there, there is a lot of great work being done. The pay gap is being closed, which is great. Um, and there are starting to be some great resources for that. So um, I was just on a, a conference call or a webinar, I guess, a couple of weeks ago where a woman was presenting 
um, who owns a tech company, who this is like literally it. They're using technology and AI to build systems that monitor your, um, your compensation and analyze your compensation and can give you real-time data and feedback when problems arise, um, which is wow. beautiful. And yeah, mm -hmm. she's starting to work with companies. And as she said, it's like taking your car to the shop and we pop open the hood and we don't just like fix it one and then go like pay gap close, bye. You're like literally putting in a new engine that every time is gonna keep watching and monitoring so that you know that progress is protected. So stuff like that is really promising and it aligns with what I found around the world, which is, um, you know, countries that have really been successful at closing their pay gap recognize that it can't, the onus can't be on employees to constantly have to prove and explore that they're being paid less because it takes a lot for an employee to like be vulnerable, to ask those questions and then to pursue it, you know, like mm -hmm. a lot of times to really pursue it, it's the individual against the company which can cost you a lot of money and legal right. fees and things like that. So the countries that have really made progress have flipped it around and put the onus on companies basically to pass a pay gap audit every few years, the same way that you pass a safety audit. And if you fail your audit, the fines start to stack up until you reconcile what you failed in the audit. Um, and so I think, you know, moving in that direction from a policy perspective would be helpful, but there are companies that can work, um, that can take this on, on their own, that can take that responsibility on their own, not just because they're being mandated or regulated. Mm -hmm. um, so all of that is promising. And I think to bring it back to the individual, you know, raise those things. Like companies that are taking these steps are starting to be the best places to work, the most desirable places to work. They have great retention. Um, if your company wants to be on that list, they should be interested in these types of topics. Yeah. So I so agree. That was that was really fabulous. Thank you for walking through that. I think that that will help people give the tools. Our listenership really loves to take action. So any action steps that people can take, um, they go do. So it's going to be exciting to watch people go do from here. <laughs> nice. I love so it. I'd love to know where, how the author journey was for you. Okay. It's not, I mean, it's, I think probably most people have thought about what would that look like to write a book or there would be this interesting topic or, you know, people kind of think about that. Like maybe that would be like a dream kind of bucket list item potentially. And then to actually take action, to start going through that, to do something that's pretty challenging. And then you realize why a lot of people don't actually write books. <laughs> Tell me about what inspired you to actually take that action and see it through and what becoming an author was like for you. Yeah. Great, great question. So I was definitely in that camp that you just described where I had been like for a few years being like, I think I want to write a book, but I don't know what I would write a book about. And I got some really great advice to write about what you're curious about, as opposed to sitting down and writing about something that you maybe already consider yourself an expert in. And so I had that going in the back of my brain and I started looking around and going, well, you know, what am I curious about? What am I curious about that I think I could commit a significant part of my life to exploring and then writing about and then having the courage to publish <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> the whole other part of the journey. Yes. Um, and it was actually, you know, an incident at my daughter's school that I think sort of pushed me over the edge. The, um, I had this wax museum assignment where they were each supposed to pick from a list of historical figures to emulate and they'd have to dress up and learn a few facts. Well, the list she came home with of historical figures to choose from was eight men and two women. Hmm. And I went, what? Like, this doesn't look right. And I called the principal and said, you know, can we switch this up? And she said, well, it's in the curriculum. We're just following the curriculum. And so I ended up reading um, my state's history curriculum and finding, and I feel like this is where that journey of like, yeah, I could get into this. I could get into this research. Um, I found that only about... 10% of the entire K through 12 curriculum specifically lists women in history that kids are supposed to learn wow. in my whole state. And I went like, boom, like here I was thinking, you know, education, there's boys and girls have equal access in our country. More girls are going to college than boys. Like maybe education is the place we've cracked the nut. And here I was finding out that, yeah, some of that surface level stuff looks equal, but underneath, you know, there's still content and 
and bias going on in outcomes. Um, and it was really then that I was like, what else am I missing? What else don't I know about that I should know about that I can then make impact on in my life? And I was like, ding, that's it. I'm curious. I'm curious. So that was the start of the curiosity journey. And then, I mean, writing was just beautiful. The bulk of it took place in 2020, which lots of people are like, wait a minute, like you kept up with that really big goal in 2020. And it was actually a beautiful project to be anchored to. It's how I wild away my quarantined weekend. <laughs> and um, it was fun because the whole book is written out of like envisioning a new future. And so mm -hmm. it was great to constantly be in this place of learning and hope. Um, and of course, everything that went on last year just exposed, you know, some of our inequities even more and gave me even more to research and write about and, and real time data um, to share. So and then all I'll add to that is publishing a book is like birthing a baby. <laughs> like, like, this is me, this is a part of me, my brain, my words, my everything. And now I have to share it with the world. And so, um, you know, hitting publish, you feel like done, boom, like baby delivered. And then you wake up the next morning and go like, I have to nurture and care for this thing. <laughs> yeah. So that's the yeah. part of the journey now. Um, yeah. And I actually think that's a little harder than the writing part. But um, right. Just like a actual baby. Yeah. <laughs> now you've got to like raise it and to be a successful like contribution to the world, right? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so many parallels too in doing this research. And when you made the comment about, you know, thinking about building a new future and how that just really parallels 2020 pretty beautifully as we were all trying to figure out as individuals, as a community, as a world, building that new future. What a really cool project to also be working on at the same time uh, to, to put forth into the world. Yep, absolutely. I, I've said it a few times. I think the universe puts us where we're meant to be. And yeah. I felt squarely where I was meant to be writing and, and even now. Yeah. And when I think about the story of only 10% um, of the curriculum actually speaks to women in history, right? You're also on the East Coast, which is where a lot of like the patriarchy was built in our nation. So oh, that's yeah. also just pretty, just pretty cool to see um, you take action on, on some of those things when when you live in an area that, yeah, would naturally like stand pretty proud on what the U S built and kind of the, the mindset framing around like the male dominated aspects of that and what we've all grown up knowing and just what we hear. And, and, uh, I think that it's pretty amazing that you did that research, found out exactly what was going on and then are using that to empower change. I just think that that's, that's pretty pretty incredible. So thank you for doing that. Yeah. So you have this book and I do love the visual of like Maureen had just mentioned for those that are listening, the book cover is how to, and then it says smash the patriarchy and it's crossed out. And then it says make the matriarchy. Did you have that vision for yourself for the book as well? Like I'd love to just kind of know a little bit that is very powerful. That stood out to me the very first thing um, and helping make that mindset shift and actually recognize that it's a thought process shift as opposed to just titling it, how to make the matriarchy without having that other visual. Mm -hmm. Tell me about, tell me about that decision and just a little bit behind your desire for, for making that, uh, making the cover what it is. Yeah. Well, it, it was really, you know, that day at lunch where my friend, you know, banged her fist on the table and said, I know, smash the patriarchy, right? And that phrase, I could just never find myself in it. And I write about that in the book. Like, I was like, yes, in theory, I'm on board. I get it. Like, these systems have to go. But this, like, smash, destroy, war, mm -hmm. fight. Mm -hmm. And then how that rolls up into, I think, so many stereotypes of, like, raging feminists or radical feminists or whatever right. you want to call them, I could just never find myself in the rage of that movement. 
Now, granted, a few times along the way on my journey, when I learned things I learned, I was like, oh, now I understand the rage. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just ultimately not a person who thinks things, we make progress by, you know, making war and, and fighting with each other about things. So um, it really was truly at that lunch, it started as just like this moment of like, you know, alliteration where I was like, I don't know, smash the patriarchy. Like, why can't we just make the matriarchy? And my lunch companion, she like leaned in the table and she was like, yes, that. I want to do that. How do we do that? And I was like, okay, I'm on to, just, I'm on to something here. And mm -hmm. that was right around the same time, you know, the incident was going on at my daughter's school with the curriculum. Um, and it just all started to like swirl and congeal and it still wasn't fully baked. And that's why I do spend time. There's a whole chapter actually where I explore existing matriarchies in the world, because I was like, if I'm going to use this word, I need to know what it actually means. And I need sure. to define for readers, my interpretation of what it means. I talk mm -hmm. about that a lot too, like how important language is because um, some of these words mean different things to all of us and carry weights mm -hmm. that may be intentional or unintentional. But, um, you know, I looked around the world and there are still existing matriarchies on the planet and they've got, you know, beautiful lessons to learn and they've got cautionary tales to learn. Um, but, you know, they are functioning and they are existing. And the ones that have beautiful to lessons to learn is this lesson of inclusion, is this lesson of running societies that are more egalitarian that, um, you know, focus more on what individuals have to contribute more so than what gender roles are supposed to contribute. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was enough for me to go like, yep, I'm okay. I'm going to use this word, how to make the matriarchy. It also does a great job of grabbing people's attention and making them go, what are you writing about? Um, yeah. Is the whole book about matriarchies? Not even in the slightest. I take that and then dissect, you know, what is modern day gender equality? Um, what's the work left to do? Um, but yeah, that's, that's really where I started. And, and that power of inclusion is really mm -hmm. what carried me through. Yeah. What was one of the most surprising things you learned when writing the book? And this is a two-part question about the research that you were doing. Mm. And then I want to know about yourself. Mm. Yeah. Well, most surprising, I shared it a little bit, really was like that Rwanda moment, like parliamentary representation, who, where is it? Um, seeing Rwanda at the top of the list. And honestly, that data is, is reevaluated each year after elections. And I just saw something recently where, um, you know, the U.S. I think is down to somewhere in the 50s or 60s on that list globally for representation by women in leadership. Wow. And so, I mean, that one continues to surprise me. And the, the, the takeaway tale there, because at the same time, you know, we have our first female vice president in this country, and we actually do have the most number of women elected to Congress in history right now. So surface value, you look at that and you go, okay, progress, right? Cool. But the reality is that there are plenty of places in the rest of the world that are making progress a lot faster than us. Mm -hmm. They are putting things in place specifically um, quotas, you know, like that surprised me too. Like we never want to think about quotas as necessarily, I don't know, it can be an icky word. It can give an icky, like, are you just here because you saved this space for me? But, you know, countries that put them in place, they work. It, it forces the envelope. It forces progress. And Rwanda, again, is a great example. Like they actually only wrote into law that 30% of their Congress had to be women. But people adopted it and they made cultural change. And it's 64% because people have made it that way. The country has made it that way. So it, it's stuff like that that was a really big surprise. You know, there's a lot of data in there about um, gender-based violence and the prevalence of it, which really woke me up to like, wow, a lot of people experience violence by an intimate partner mm -hmm. um, more than you think. And, mm -hmm. and what can I do? To change those ways because that's unacceptable and scary. Um, right. There's, I mean, there's, there's so every corner, every chapter, there was something that surprised me that, that changed my worldview and shifted my lens. Um, to answer your second question, you know, what changed about me? Um, it really is feeling so much more confident in, in talking about this stuff and in being like, no, this matters and it's important. And 
in one of the last chapters, as you can imagine, as I'm telling you, like every chapter is full of something surprising. It can get overwhelming really fast. And I think sure. that's um, often what scares people off from working on things, things that feel so big, like <laughs> solving gender equality. Um, but I do, in the later chapters, really take it back into my own sphere of influence and say, where are those fears? And um, I told you about how I'm changing the way I talk to my daughter about, you know, boys. It also matters, like, how I talk to her about school, um, mm -hmm. making sure that she does feel empowered when she's struggling, because so often girls in school don't get that extra boost of courage. And that's where boys start to pull ahead in math and science. Inadvertently, it's not on purpose, but it can just be the little ways in which we encourage them. But it's also sure. stuff like looking at, you know, when we have people over, like our gender roles perpetuating, like are the guys all outside drinking beers while all the women are in the kitchen <laughs> doing the cooking and the cleaning. And yeah, like answer is probably yes, very often. And it, even just little stuff like that to be like, no, I'm not going to be like that at my house anymore. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Love that. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's made me continually curious, I would say, is the big overall change. I'm constantly looking around, gobbling up more data and thinking about how can I pull this data into my spheres of influence and, and make a little change every day. Oh, that sounds like an incredible journey and one that might potentially bring a second book out, maybe? Yeah, it's um, writing from curiosity is an amazing, was amazing advice. And so I am curious. I'm actually curious about courage. So because it takes courage to do this work, and I think it's going to take a lot of courage to build the future, but I think we also toss the word courage around a lot. Mm -hmm. And I would love to unpack, like, what does it actually mean to be courageous? Is, mm -hmm. it, is it, you know, uh, a reflex? Is it intentional? And can you build, can you build intentional, can you cultivate curiosity is kind of what I think. Interesting. Ooh, it sounds spicy and like a great, a great book to unfold. Yeah. A lot of <laughs> curiosity in there. <laughs> I just have to get this baby out of diapers and then I right. can like start on another one. <laughs> That's helpful. Yes. Uh, two babies in diapers when one's mobile and one's not, it's not any different than having twins in my opinion, but you know, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> So tell us a little bit about um, what reader you envision for this book. Who is this book for? And yeah, what, who should be picking up this book after listening to this interview today? Yeah. I mean, I intentionally started, it really was, I was writing with my girlfriend in mind. I was writing with all the women who I grew up with. I grew up in a tiny little town where things just way, were the way they were. And we thought that's the way they were and things were okay. And we've all kind of gone through the motions. We've gone to school. We have jobs. We put our kids on the bus. We do all the things. And it's been my girlfriends who have reached back out to me and said, like, this book blew my mind and I'm going to change some things as well. So it's, it's for all my girlfriends. It's for all your girlfriends and it's for your girlfriends, girlfriends. But then as I shared, what has blown me away actually is the response I've had from men. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of an unexpected audience. But the feedback that I've gotten from men has been, it's very approachable. It's not preachy. They, it doesn't make them feel bad for being a dude in a patriarchy. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Um, it opens their mind and gives them some very approachable and accessible ways to change the way they think about these things as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, dads with daughters have said like, thank you. Thank you. I needed to read this and understand this. Um, so I would encourage, you know, hand it off to your girlfriends and, and the men in your life too, who might be open, um, you know, to reading and thinking a little differently. Yeah. And I love that point about, uh, not having men feel guilty for being a, a man right. <laughs> essentially. Right. Um, in our world here too, there are lots of men that actually approach, our company because they're like, we want to learn too. We want to learn how to be better employers, better people in the community. And so can you help us like also be a place that women love to work at um, or just our good, you know, community contributors and that type of thing as well in um, the world of women. So thank you for writing that. It sounds like a great resource to be able to pass off to 
uh, clients of ours as well, which yeah. we'd love. So any other resource that we can provide people just sounds great. And uh, I'm so happy that you're getting the feedback that you're getting and I can't wait to pick up the book as well. Where can our listeners find the book to go purchase? Where does it exist out there? Yeah. I mean, it exists pretty much in every place you might buy books, except maybe like your little local bookstore. Although if you ask for it, they can get it. Um, but it's, you know, right there on Amazon, um, both as an ebook and in paper, um, paper copy. And as I mentioned later this year, it'll, it'll be in an audio book as well. So Barnes and Nobles, all those places um, should be able to get it for you. Um, and then I also, you know, put stuff out there in the world about my work and about sort of that updated research that's keeping me curious and thinking um, on LinkedIn. So I would love if folks want to follow me on LinkedIn. Um, and then I'm also on Instagram at um, Make the Matriarchy. Excellent. Maureen, thank you so much for your time on the show today. It was such a pleasure to have you join us, to get to learn more about you and the work that you do, and to get some insights on the book so that we can go check it out and have that as part of um, our equipment, if you will, like part of our, you know, I hate to use like the armor analogy since we're like also talking about like not going to war with it, but yeah. just equipping ourselves with that information and knowledge from a research, from a research-based backing is very powerful and very empowering. So thank you for doing what you do. And thanks for being part of the show today. 